Hey, I'm live. Here we go. Live from not such a sunny South Africa. I'm Marianne Shearer and I'm beaming to you live or streaming to you live from Gordons Bay in the Western Cape, just outside Cape Town. So for those of you who don't know who I am, somebody's like, who is this person? What is she doing? <clears throat> my background is I've been interested in health and healthy living probably my whole life. I mention this often, but I'm going to mention it again for people that are new. My mother uh, was a farmer's wife and grew, we grew up our first several years of our lives. We were on a farm. There were no cell phones. There was no internet. You couldn't just Google symptoms. So my mother had this thick <clears throat> medical encyclopedia. I'm trying to see if I've got one here. I had one and it got burnt in the fire. But thick, like really thick, like a big thick textbook. But it had these huge pictures of people with diseases in them. Like they looked huge to me because I was little and my eyes were this big. And I couldn't even read and I was looking at these pictures. And I saw terrible pictures of people with enlarged thyroid goiter problems and their eyes bulging out and big wounds and growths on people and all kinds of gory, scary looking things. And I really think I frightened myself into health because I sat with that book and then when I could read, I was reading and looking at the pictures and reading some of the stuff and what they were. So it was a book with symptoms. It didn't necessarily always say there were some kind of guidelines on what to do. It was like a family's encyclopedia kind of book. So health was something that I was scared about. I was terrified of getting a disease. I remember waking one up one night when I was 15 years old in an absolute cold sweat, this total fear that I would get cancer and I was going to die of it. And the only contact that I had with cancer up until that point was a young girl who lived across the road. Well, in fact, her grandfather, grandmother lived across the road from us and her father would bring her to visit her at her grandmother. And she was my age and he would carry her in. She couldn't walk and her hair, she was completely bald, her hair had fallen out. And like to me, that was a terrible, terrible disease if you lost your hair. So it was with that in mind that when I was, you know, studying that the subjects I chose were anatomy and physiology and chemistry. I didn't know what I was going to do with this. I just knew that I had this insatiable desire to know more about my body and how it worked. And so it was these were my favorite things was to find out. I used to go to bed at night, even once I was married, with a physiology textbook in my lap reading it. I did know that I didn't like blood and pus and gore and vomiting. To this day, I still don't cope very well with those things. So I knew that being a doctor wasn't the way to go. I didn't want to be a nurse and clean up all the mess afterwards. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I started looking at nutrition. I started reading books when I was still in high school about nutrition and how we could change, for me at the time, I was very concerned about my weight, but health issues started to come into some of the materials I was reading. And then when I developed all these health issues following what I thought was a really healthy diet with whole wheat bread that I made myself, only brown sugar, fruit and veggies, I thought I was doing everything right, but I ended up with all these terrible problems, including bipolar disorder, which I found was directly related to my sugar addiction. I was, I made fudge using brown sugar. I made cakes using brown sugar thinking I was doing good stuff, but I had a sugar addiction. And so I then found out through trial and error that diet was a big factor and took out the refined sugar and my brain started working properly and the chemical imbalance was completely healed. You cause a chemical imbalance. You're not just born with it. You might be born with a genetic predisposition. And that's what I love about Colin Campbell's Fantastic book, Whole. If you haven't yet read it, there's an amazing section in here on genetics and how you can actually change your genetic makeup, your genetic expression. This is a fantastic table over here. You can see it's got um, uh, parental genome, and a newborn genome, uh, health health genes, and this side is disease, disease genes, okay? So health, health genes result in, gene, uh, in health. And in this side, we've got the same diagram so showing disease genes result in genes. But this side shows you that if you interfere, if you nutritional interception, if you intercept your expression of your unhealthy genes into disease, you intercept that with change in your diet, then what happens is your genetic expression, it actually shows here, nutritional interception results in Healthy genes producing health, and that's exactly what happens. 
So it's very important for us to realize that even if we've got unhealthy genes, like in my family, it's allergies and hay fever, you there's alcoholism, exactly and there's, um, oh, I'm trying to think of all the different things. In Mark's family, it's diabetes and high blood pressure. So there's all these genes that want to express the poor health when we live an unhealthy lifestyle. And we think that we're living a healthy lifestyle like I was. And so with me, my genetic expression was both Mark and I suffered from terrible indigestion as well. But when we changed our lifestyle and diet and began, because of understanding physiology and anatomy, I started looking for ways to improve it. For, for you know, And I'll, as I go along, I'll share. But I was quite surprised in reading physiology textbooks that the doctors couldn't see what I was seeing. And I thought, well, I must be wrong because what do I know? I'm not a doctor. And then I began to study more and more and more and found out that doctors are great at diagnosing diseases most of the time, and they're great at treating them with medicine and surgery. And usually when things are treated with medicine and surgery, they, they're actually helping you to manage your condition. So when we take something like the topic for today, which is reflux, also known as GERD or gastroesophageal um, reflux disease, it's now a disease, it used to be a condition, so the minute you say disease, it was like, well, I'm stuck in the middle with you, this is it, I'm stuck, I have this condition, I have GERD, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm going to have to take medication, so we live on antacid medication, and then it gets worse because it doesn't get better when you start treating the symptom and not the cause, if you're just managing your disease, it's going to get worse, it's not going to get better. It will get worse and worse and worse the older you get because you're not treating with the, the you're not treating the cause of the condition or the disease. Okay, we've seen the human body repair the most phenomenal things, whether it's been liver cancer. We've had a young girl recently type one diabetes. She's not on any insulin anymore. Her pancreas is actually now functioning, and people say, but she was misdiagnosed. No, she wasn't. She was diagnosed in a hospital with doctors doing tests on her. Fortunately, she caught it early enough, we were able to make changes. And I've seen people even who've been diagnosed for 10 years, and it sounds phenomenal. Oh, it can't be, it can't be. But you've got to understand <clears throat> that doctors look at the disease and how to treat it with medicine and surgery. That's what they know. So they are not taught how to find solutions to the problems, find the cause of the, the root cause of the problem. Not the cause of your problem is that you've got a flap going into your esophagus that is not secure and it's flapping around and anything spills down. That's not the cause. What's the cause that causes the flap to get slack and not toned and not work properly? What is the cause and how can you intersect that? How can you change that? And there's a lot you can do. So just to go through the basics, we'll go through the basics of gastro um, esophageal um, uh, reflux disease, <laughs> GERD, okay, we'll go through the symptoms of GERD, whether you call it reflux, indigestion, heartburn, it doesn't matter what you call, some people call it regurgitation, it doesn't matter what it is, at the end of the day, there are specific things you can do to correct it, and it will be, you won't have the problem anymore, and your digestive tract, including your little flap, can fix itself, and it does, I've seen it so many times, I've seen people have surgery, and I've seen the flap be fixed and be okay for a couple of months, and then it starts all over again because you can fix it several times. It's like going and, and fixing something with your car. Let's say there's a problem that it's spluttering and it's just not cleaning, and then they go and clean out the air filter, but you you don't stop doing what it is that's putting out the, the dirty air into the car, for example. So you've got to, and maybe that's not a good example, but it's like, it's like you've got to stop the actions that are resulting in the diseased condition. And when that happens, you're giving your body all the tools it needs to repair itself. You're also creating an environment in which your genetic expression your genes that will, will be expressed are the healthy genes and you'll, that will result in health, okay? So let's take a look at um, some of the, the, in, the information we have on, oh gosh, let me just put my uh, glasses on and move that across. All right. All right, so most people at some time have experienced 
reflux. We, and, and basically what it is, is you find that this acidity is actually spilling up into your esophagus. And, and if you bend over, it feels like it's coming out. So you are eating your food. And, and then after a meal, you have this like reflux where it's regurgitation. It feels like your food is just spilling out and it burns. It's unpleasant. And you can almost get to a point where you're just nervous to eat because you're in continual pain and discomfort. And so, you, as I said, you can go and take medication for it, but it's not dealing with the cause, okay? So let's just have a look at the overall symptoms and what they are. Um, you've got a burning sensation in your chest or this heartburn that's here and sometimes here. It's anywhere from here to here. And you'll find that your food is repeating on you. So if you've eaten something like, you know, that's got quite a strong flavor like fish or cabbage or or anything, anything in the meal that's got quite a strong flavor, you'll find that that's the flavor very often that repeats on you. You can have this sort of backwash, it's what I refer to as regurgitation. Uh, you can have upper abdominal chest pain. So some people actually get to a place where they're very, very stressed about it because they think they've got a heart condition. And, and they keep going for tests and nothing shows up and then it's usually a digestive problem. You can have a problem swallowing as well. And you can have a sensation of having a lump in your throat all the time, like it's not feeling like something's not going down properly. So, so normally, you know, you will be told if you've got any of these symptoms, go and see your doctor. And, and, and if you just look at a traditional medical site, you will see. If you just go to something like the Mayo Clinic site, it will tell you a lot of the things I'm going to tell you anyway. But what is weird is that they'll offer surgery and medication instead of correcting these things. So it says it's caused by frequent acid reflux uh, or reflux of non-acidic contents of the stomach. So when you sw swallow, there's this um, band of muscle around the bottom of the esophagus that keeps the food in your stomach. And what happens is that basically gets flabby and, and doesn't work so well. So it's called the lower esophageal sphincter, and it relaxes to allow your food in, but does, it closes to keep it in your stomach, Okay. So when this doesn't do its job and it's not um, um, it not as relaxed as it should be, that's what can give that lump in the throat feeling. Or it's not, it's too relaxed. It's too, it's like a pair of baggy, uh, elasticized pants, for example. It keeps falling down. So what happens is the food is spilling over. Um, and it says the risk factors are things like obesity, bulging in the top of the stomach above the diaphragm, or what they refer to as a hiatal hernia or hiatus hernia in some people, pregnancy, when you've got a baby in here and the baby could be kicking your stomach and it can. And that's, I remember the time in my life when I suffered from the most acid reflux or you know, this indigestion was when I was pregnant with my three children. Connective tissues, I didn't have it with my third daughter though, and I'll tell you why. Connective tissue disorders, scleroderma can do it, and delayed stomach em emptying. Now, you've got to wonder why we would have delayed stomach emptying. Very often, it's because you're constipated. So you can't take something like reflux and then just say it's, it's one thing that's happening and nothing else. It's a problem with your digestive tract. And when you look at the digestive tract, you can have one of several things. You could have constipation. You could have diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome. There's all these things that you could have wrong with your digestive tract where it's not working as well as it is. And some people, very common is irritable bowel syndrome. And I would actually put GERD or reflux as almost part of that IBS because the very things that cause IBS are the same things that cause the reflux problems. And so that's what we've basically got to deal with today is is finding out how, what we can do, and how we can do it, and how we can fix this, because we can. If you understand how your digestive tract works, you begin to understand what it is, what's the problem that's going. And one uh, side also says um, some of the reasons for getting it is smoking, eating large meals, eating late at night, eating certain foods that trigger them, such as fatty and fried foods, and drinking certain beverages such as alcohol or coffee taking medications such as aspirin, for example. So there's a lot of different things that can contribute to it, but we've got to find out what the problem is. When we understand that our digestive tract isn't just a bunch of pipes that food passes through and there's a whole process, there's a chemical process taking place, you begin to understand why it's so important to pay attention to it. Okay. So the first part is our mouth. We put something in our mouth and we start chewing it and your body's going to recognize that there is... 
uh, glucose or carbohydrates in it, for example, and you'll secrete a salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that digests starches. In particular, the one in your mouth is called tyalin. Spelt with a P just to confuse you, P-T-Y-L-I-N, and you secrete that, it starts the process of digesting starches. Now, starches digest, uh, so they need to break down because <clears throat> when we have carbohydrates coming into our body, also known as starches, so excuse me, let me just drink some water. <clears throat> they come in in long chains. You have long chains of molecules. So you get, you get, um, let me actually draw it for you right here so you can have a look at this. Check that you can see this carbohydrates. <clears throat> Hydrates. Sorry, can't spell today. Uh, the carbohydrates come in in long chains. They can be various shapes. This is just for ease of drawing this on, okay? These will be glucose molecules. And they'll be long. They think of it like a string of pearls or a string of beads. You can have things branched off on the side here, but at the end of the day, they come in in long chains. You can't absorb carbohydrates like this, okay? You need carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are needed to give your cells energy. They're needed for the brain to function properly. They actually save. If you eat enough carbohydrates, you need to eat. A, you can get away with eating a lot less proteins because proteins are needed for growth and repair. They can be converted into carbohydrates as can fats, but it's a very expensive. When I say expensive, it's a lot of hard work for the body to actually start breaking down. Um, it's a lot of hard work. It's, it requires a lot of um, energy by the body and a lot of hard work with the kidneys particularly. So if you don't eat enough carbohydrates, you can cause a lot of strain on the kidneys, the your urinary tract uh, system, and you can end up with problems. In some instances, I've seen people end up with kidney failure and kidney cancer from high protein, no carbohydrate diet. So carbohydrates are needed by the body. You can't, what, no cell can function without carbohydrates. We have to have them. And your body will move hell or high water, even if it's going to damage the kidneys to give you carbohydrates. So it's better to give your body natural carbohydrates from a plant source and whole food ones. We're not talking about refined carbohydrates. We're talking about whole carbohydrates. That could be anything from a peach or a plum or a bunch of grapes, which some people won't eat. But, you know, these are carbohydrates. You could have you know, a certain amount of carbohydrates in a butternut, for example, or in potatoes or rice. Um, there's carbohydrates in virtually every single plant food to a certain extent. There's a certain amount of carbohydrates. Okay. So carbohydrates need to break down. <clears throat> and it starts over here, which is a polysaccharide. Saccharide is just a term, sometimes spelled with an H. Polysaccharide is a term used for, it's a scientific term for a glucose molecule, okay? So polysaccharide means poly is many, many glucose molecules. Your body uses digestion, so now you're chewing your carbohydrates and you secrete the enzyme tylen, oh, it's not spelling properly, tylen, in your saliva, and it breaks it down to a disaccharide, which is two molecules. Di just means two. Okay, so di means two. Now, when it gets to that point, you still can't absorb that and use that efficiently in your body. And if you don't have enzymes to break it down or your food starts to ferment in your for stomach for whatever reason, then you're going to end up with a problem with the glucose molecules and the protein molecules, that are, which is a different digestive process altogether. What happens is they actually start to ferment, but we'll get to that point later on, okay? Because they can't break down or they get absorbed and they're not properly broken down and then it contributes to leaky gut syndrome, which is all kinds of allergies and intolerances. And you just feel like you, and I remember being like that, having this GERD, which I just thought was heartburn as a kid. I had it as a kid, bend over and I'd go to a barbecue and bend over and all it felt like, well, my food was going to drop out of my digestive tract. And I had all those problems and I developed into allergies and hay fever and painful joints and all kinds. You begin to feel like, and in fact, in some instances, you'll go and see a doctor and he'll eventually kind of suggest that possibly this is a mental issue you've got because they can't find anything. 
And it's starting in the digestive tract because of the way we're eating. But we're going to look at that, okay? So disaccharides then break down to, and I'm looking at what's showing over here, is monosaccharides. You can't see monosaccharides. Mono means one, and it looks pretty messy. Let's just pull it up. And then basically what you've got here is individual molecules of glucose, and in this form, your body can absorb glucose molecules and we can use them fully, okay? So it's very important for this process that starts in your mouth. It starts in your mouth. It splits it into disaccharides over here, which is the mouth. And once it gets to the duodenum, which is like after your stomach, the, it's not quite the intestine. It's like a half stomach, half intestine, some people explain it as being. But in the duodenum, we secrete more of the salivary amylases, and that's what breaks it down into the monosaccharides, and then we can digest it. The problem is we eat in a way that doesn't encourage that, particularly in westernized countries. We've all been taught the whole food group theory that we've got to eat foods from every single group at every single meal. We now know that's not the case. Science has shown that's really not the case. And so, But that's how we taught, because it's in the interest of food industry to eat as much as we can at every meal and so we encourage to make sure we're getting all these nutrients and so we just eat we overeat then we're eating junk food in between and we actually abuse our digestive tracts when you look at people in rural communities who eat very simply they'll eat one or two feeds at meals at a time they may kill a chicken once a week so they'll have animal protein once a week and in between they're eating flatbreads with vegetables in the evenings or potatoes with vegetables or potatoes with or rice and, and 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 beans for example it's very simple if you look at the rural communities around the world we don't have the digestive problems we have in westernized countries but we're so focused as i say and trying to eat all the different food groups at every single meal we actually end up making a huge big mess in our digestive tracts and it's simply because we don't know how our digestive tract, tracts work oh come on Turn this over. Okay. So what happens is we start digesting the carbohydrates in the mouth and it goes down to into your through your esophagus, into your stomach, and it carries on undigesting. Let me let me explain it like this, okay? So if you remember the pH scale, and it's a small p and a capital H, pH scale when um we measure from 0 to 7 and 7 to 14, okay? So if this was a pH scale, um, that would be acid. This is alkaline. So here's what I found out when I was reading the physiology textbooks. And this puzzled me because I thought, but nobody tells us this stuff and we don't know this stuff. And you can literally read it. You can flip open Guyton's medical physiology, any physiology textbook that describes the digestive tract, if it's an accurate one, will explain how the food digests. So if you're reading about protein digestion, you will read that uh, protein, protein digests, let's see if this color shows up, ideally at a pH of 2, 2, 3. So between the pH of 2 to 3, protein digests sufficiently. Carbohydrates, I'm just going to put carbos, and, and I'm making the space just because it's easier, is not much higher than that, but it is higher. So the space is not that big, but it's just so I can put everything in. Carbohydrates start digesting in your mouth with that enzyme we secrete and carries on digesting in your stomach as long as the pH is at a level of 4 and above. Okay? Now, I mean, if you did chemistry at school, even if you didn't do chemistry at school, the average person knows, and we've learned this, basic, basic science, when you first do it in primary school, you can't have two separate pH values in one container. It's not possible. If I had to take the pH of water, good drinking water the way we designed to drink it should have a pH of 7, which is neutral. 
That means the minerals are perfectly balanced. Your body can use it efficiently. And I always encourage people to drink water between the pH of 6.8 and 7.2 maximum, not to drink alkaline water because your body is not able to handle it. So you'll take minerals, acid minerals from your body, which are meant to work in conjunction with the alkaline minerals, and you'll throw your mineral balance out because your body's trying to get the water back to its to a pH of 7, which is where it should be. And that's when water tastes it's sweeter. The most popular waters around the world, things like Evian water, their pH is very close to 7, if not 7. It's the sweetest tasting water. So that's another thing altogether. So we were all taught that if you had a glass of water with a pH of 7, and you took, even if I just took a tomato and squeezed some tomato juice, but if I took a lemon and I squeezed, this isn't a lemon, but we'll pretend it is. If I squeeze lemon juice into this water, this juice of the lemon can have a pH of 2 to 3, maybe 1 to 3 even. It's quite acidic in some lemons. If I squeeze lemon juice into here, we wouldn't be able to test the lemon pH and the water pH separately because it's in one container at the same time. They would mix together and they would actually kind of counteract each other. So the pH of the water would probably drop down to, depending on the pH of the lemon, probably drop down to somewhere between three and maybe five or even six. So it's no longer alkaline, okay? So it's impossible to have two separate pH values in one stomach, stomach's about the size of a fist, so one stomach, you cannot have a separate pH of two to three with one that's four and above at the same time in the same place. Okay? It's impossible. It's just chemically, physically impossible. So basically what happens is you're eating the potatoes and there's nothing wrong with potatoes. You're eating your nice brown rice. It's nothing wrong with rice. You're eating it and you'll go and have some chicken or fish with it. And if you're a vegan, you'll go and have a rice dish with some nuts in it. Let's say we put some pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds or almonds, which can be 20 to 30 percent protein. And, and your chicken and your fish is 18 to 20 percent. And your your animal, your, your uh, red meat is usually a bit higher than that 20 to 30 percent. Much like nuts and seeds, they range from 20 to 30%. So you're eating protein foods, high-protein foods, with high-carbohydrate foods at the same time, okay? So what happens is you're eating the chicken and the fish or the nuts and the seeds and the, I mean, the chicken and the rice, and you're eating the seeds and the, and the potatoes, whatever it is. It gets the the Digestion of starches starts in your mouth. So it started fermenting, okay? So you're chewing it, chewing it, chewing it, secrete hydrochloric acid. It's very important for you to actually to prevent reflux and any gastrointestinal regurgitation of any kind or any gastrointestinal problems of any kind. Bloating, flatulence, gas. Some people feel it all up here and some people feel it down below. It's the gas and the bloating sensation. If you're having any of those, it's because your food has started fermenting for a very good reason. You've eaten the stock carbohydrates. It's gone into the stomach. The body recognizes that there's concentrated protein there. Your stomach recognizes it. Your stomach's designed to recognize concentrated protein in a reasonably high quantity. I mean, if you ate a nut or a seed with a bowl of rice and there was one nut or five nuts and that was it, it's probably not going to cause a problem. But if you had a portion, like a quarter cup, to a half a cup of nuts or seeds with, you know, a bowl of rice or, or your, you have a piece of chicken or fish or meat with your rice or your potatoes, you're going to have a problem. Your body sees there's concentrated protein and there's quite a lot of it. So it starts to secrete and something called, you all heard of this, hydrochloric acid, HCl. Hydrochloric acid is secreted by the stomach to activate activate something called pepsinogen, pepsinogen, which is a, an enzyme that starts breaking down proteins. So we don't have an enzyme in the mouth for carbohydrate, for protein digestion. We've got one for carbohydrates. In the stomach, we have got one that contains um, an enzyme. We've got an enzyme that's specifically, this activates pepsinogen, to start breaking down protein. So when we start breaking down protein, what's happened is we secrete the hydrochloric acid. It's very acidic. And what that does is it brings the pH down to this level over here, 2 to 3. It's saying we need a pH of 2 to 3 to start this digestive process. But now we need one of 4 and above, and it started in the mouth. So we've got carbohydrates that are partially digested. They're in a warm, moist place. 
and now the hydrochloric acid has dropped the pH down to here. The minute it drops below four, carbohydrates can't digest anymore, but they're partially digested. They're in a warm, moist place. And this digestive process can't take place anymore. And the normal reaction to that is that your food starts to ferment. It just ferments. And what you get when your food ferments is you get gas, you get alcohol. Yep, you make your own for free. You get acetic acid. And you get ammonia. Gas, some people just get rid of it. They belch it, they pass it down in the nether regions. Alcohol can be a tiny amount, can be quite a bit. There are people that have known to, every time they consume a meal, they get inebriated, they become drunk mildly because they're producing pretty neat alcohol and a lot of it in some people. Some people is very little. I remember reading the case of a man in Japan some years back who every time he ate, he got drunk and nobody could explain it. And I'm like, well, go to the physiology textbooks. It'll explain to you what happens. When your food ferments, you produce alcohol. Acetic acid, which is like very strong vinegar, and ammonia. Ammonia is a powerful, very powerful carcinogenic substance. So it's not surprising because alcohol is also a sterilizing agent. It destroys your friendly bacteria. Cetic acid is also a sterilizing agent. It also destroys your friendly bacteria. So a lot can go wrong. Once you upset that gut biome, everything can just go out of kilter. And the next thing you've got a big problem. Okay. So in, in ammonia being a powerful carcinogen, it's not surprising that the most common cancer in westernized countries we were taught to mix all our foods together is colorectal cancer. We get it. Um, the most common cancer is cancer of the colon and the rectum in westernized country. Besides eating foods that are highly carcinogenic, fried foods, heated foods, processed foods, high intakes of animal protein, we're also producing ammonia that actually is a powerful carcinogenic sub substance. It's not surprising when people say to me, what have I done to get cancer? Why is God doing this to me? When we do it out of ignorance because we don't know how our bodies work. It's our responsibility to learn this. You can't leave it up to the doctor. And expect. he's seeing like, you know, the average doctor needs to see one patient every seven and a half minutes, my doctor friends have told me. They say that's what you have to do to make, make your income financially viable because as a doctor, it's you that's earning the money. You don't have a whole bunch of people unless you've got a big practice, but usually as one doctor and he's seeing many people in a day. So he says, I don't have time to explain how the digestive tract works to you. That's your problem. I can just look at your symptom and give you something for it. And it's your choice whether you take it or not. I can't even please you. So at the end of the day, it's our decision. And we hand it over our bodies in a sense. We just kind of trust other people who don't know anything. They don't know about the physiology of the body. But actually what they've studied is medicine and surgery. That's what they've studied. So that's what they're going to prescribe for you is medicine and or surgery. If you know that your digestive tract works like this, you can say, hold on a second, what am I doing? I am doing the wrong thing here. I need to eat either proteins or carbohydrates at a meal. Now, people have referred to this as the food combining diet, or they refer to it as the great apartheid diet. We had a doctor here in South Africa who actually used to refer to it as and say, it's nonsense, it's nonsense. And when I took him back to the physiology textbooks and said, but on this page in Guyton's Physiology, it says proteins digested a pH of 2 to 3. And on that page over there, it says carbohydrates digested a pH of 4 and above. And you can't have two separate pHs in, a, in, a, in, in one container. It's chemically and physically impossible. So you get this fermentation. Then from that point on, he stopped calling it the Barté diet. It's like just the basics of physiology is not taught to anybody. Everybody ignores this. And the reason we're not taught it because in rural communities, people do this naturally. They'll get up in the morning, they might have some vegetables or some fruit, or they might have a slice of toast, some homemade bread. It's usually mid-morning that they will eat. It's not this first early thing in the morning, and they usually only eat twice. So there isn't this continual abuse of the stomach where we're taught to eat six meals a day or five meals a day, three meals and two snacks in between and one after supper, so it ends up being sick. It's just this continual onslaught on the digestive tract. We never rest our digestive tract. It's working hard all the time. We'll go and rest a factory. You know, factories will shut down for one month of the year during the summer holidays and the machinery will all get, you know, uh, serviced and fixed. The only people that service their digestive tracts are people that fast on a regular basis. And one of the best ways to fix a problem like reflux and where you've got your 
opening into your esophagus is not working the way it should be is to rest your digestive tract. So fasting is one of the best ways to just allow your body to, to repair the digestive tract. And it sounds crazy, oh, I'm fasting. What do you mean fasting? Well, people are designed, and again, medi Garten's medical physiology will tell you that the human body contains enough nutrients to last several weeks. And in fact, they're calculated to about 40 days. The average person of average weight has enough nutrients to for your body to break down fat reserves and to repair itself during that. I'm not telling you to go and do a 40-day fast. Please don't. I'm just saying that that's what the textbooks tell us. There are enough nutrients to... Um, to allow us to fast. And I'm not suggesting that you, you fast that long. What I'm recommending that you do is if you do have a, 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 a gastroesophageal a, a esophageal problem and you've got this problem with reflux, you've got any digestive problem, is arrest your stomach. Just give it a break. Just take a day a week, like a Saturday when you just can lie around, a day of the week where you don't have to do much and there's not a whole bunch of people cooking around you. Some people find it easy to just go to work and fast. They say it doesn't affect their blood sugar. Some people, their blood sugar drops really low when they fast. And so if you really struggle with it, then I recommend that you just eat one kind of thing, just something simple like an apple, simple type of fruit, nothing rich. Apples are great for giving the digestive tract a rest, and if you really want to give it a better rest, then do it freshly extracted apple juice, sipped slowly, diluted with water throughout the day, just to maintain your blood sugar. Because what you're doing is you're just shutting your factory down. It doesn't have to secrete a whole lot of enzymes when you fast because there's no digestion. If you're just doing something like apples, you you don't need to require a whole lot of digestive enzymes to digest any fruit, really. It's pre-digested. The nutrients are all broken down into proteins and carbohydrates in their simplest form. So you can just absorb the nutrients efficiently. So if you really struggle with the idea of fasting, then go a mono diet just on a simple fruit, something like pears or, or, or peat or, uh, or ap apples are probably the, the – some people really enjoy bananas, but then make sure they're ripe, okay? Just rest your digestive tract. If it's a really bad condition, you can do between one and three days of fasting, and you should be able to do that regularly once a month until your digestive tract has repaired itself. Or you might find you more comfortable just doing one day every week. So some people are comfortable doing that, which I kind of like because then you've got a routine. Like Mondays you fast or Saturdays you fast or Sundays, whatever. Fridays you fast. You just give your digestive tract a, a rest. You can eat breakfast and lunch on one day, skip supper and eat break, skip breakfast and lunch the next day and then have supper. And then I'd break that supper with fruit. Don't go and have a big steak because that's not helping your stomach. It's cooked. It's highly concentrated. It requires a lot of work. The simpler your food is, the simpler your meals are, the easier it is for your body to ease back into the digestive process. So break your fast always on fresh fruit or fresh vegetables. But fruit's usually the easiest, and it helps to stabilize your blood sugar the quickest, okay? So if you do this, if you don't mix proteins and starches, and you're also more careful about fruit, I'll explain that as well in a little while, then you will find that you um, your digestive tract just starts to work. Some people don't even need to fast. They just stop mixing proteins and starches and start combining their fruit properly. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this very well. I'll try and get a little bit closer up there because this is a really pretty chart we designed years ago, and it still stands. And um, and if you email us, you can get a copy of this email to you and you can print it out to be nice and big. It's really, really tiny here. I needed a bigger printer, but it wasn't available at the time. So let me explain this very carefully to you. This is down here. We just spoke about proteins and starches. OK, so these are the protein foods. These are the starch foods. And these are what we call the neutral foods. So down here we've got things like eggs and dairy products, and we've got fish and meat and milk and nuts and seeds. And what else we've got here? Okay. And then here we've got neutral vegetables. This is things like artichokes and asparagus and aubergines and your things like your carrots and your cabbage and your lettuce, all your neutral vegetables. They're not very high in carbohydrates. Things that are high in carbohydrates here, starches we call them are things like potatoes and bread and pasta and rice and millet and oats and all those things are over here. So it's this simple. You have potatoes with vegetables and salad or you have fish with vegetables and salad. That's basically what it amounts to. So you can eat those two groups together or those two groups together. So you could have a bolognese sauce made out of 
tomatoes and lentils and finely chopped carrots and baby marrows. Honestly, bolognese, you can put any vegetable into it. You don't have to put lentils in there with lots of tomato and all the flavors you put into traditional bolognese like uh, oregano and you might put a little bit of garlic or I use a garlic and herb salt. Um, you might need something to sweeten it slightly. I like to grate some sweet potato in there to sweeten it rather than adding sugar. <clears throat> and you could use apple juice as part of the liquid that goes into the bolognese sauce to give it a sweetness and well as well. Um, and so you eat those two groups or those two groups. Now, what is going on up here? There are certain fruits that don't digest very well together. And those are your very, very sweet fruits, which digest like carbohydrates, things like very sweet grapes. Bananas are like a carbohydrate, basically. Dried fruit like raisins and dates. If you go and mix them with your acid fruit, like your pineapples and your some of your like strawberries, for example, some people who have got a sensitive digestive tract and have this regurgitation problem will get the regurgitation or the reflux just by mixing those two groups, your sweet fruits with your acid fruits. Now, in the back of our book, Perfect Health and in Healthy Kids, which is, oh gosh, about to be published uh, or about to be reissued for the third time. It first came out 21 years ago, uh, is at the printers right now. We finally got it to the printers and it's there. So that should be available as well. But different story. And I've got a nice story to tell you about a little kid once and this reflux problem. So um let's get back to this uh at the back of those books the food combining chart is there not looking with there's no color it's just laid out and i'll show you what it looks like um basically that's what it looks like that'll be your acid fruit acid fruit sweet fruit like that and on this side you've got your carbohydrates carbohydrates and your proteins and your neutral veggies so that's at the back of the book perfect health which is this one here you may have an earlier copy with a different cover um, and it's in basically the back of all of our books so you can mix but you'll get this chart if you email us mark will put the email in there if uh, he hasn't put it in already let's just check a look um, all right so so we've got, um, yeah, Mark will put it in there. You email us, uh, it's info at, Mark will give it to us. I know he's listening on the other side and he'll pop it up there, okay? So um, if you email us, you'll get a, uh, the, um, a digital version of this will be sent to you. And you can print it out yourself and a digital version of our little digestive booklet which deals with all digestive problems, okay? So you'll get two things, but we need your email address for that, okay? Okay, so uh, where are we? So acid fruit and subacid can be eaten together. So you can have apples with passion fruit or granadilla or with oranges and pineapples and lemons and limes and uh, all kinds of things over here, all right? And then you can, or you can have it with apples or you can have it with apricots or you can have it with peaches and pears. Or you could have peaches and pears with raisins or bananas and dates. So that's what you're doing. So one of the questions here says, Marianne, is this only animal product protein that you're not supposed to mix or even soy meats and meat substitutes? Anything that has a protein content that is above between 10 and 15%, and that can be – legumes are usually below 10%, so legumes can eat – can be eaten quite comfortably both sides. I do talk about that in the digestive booklet as well. You need to soak your legumes overnight, pour the water off, and then cook them yourself. That way you're less likely to have any digestive discomfort. And if you eat legumes, it's your beans, your chickpeas, your lentils, on a regular basis. Let's say you have some hummus every day with some chickpeas in it, and you have one or three times a week you're having something with lentils or beans in it, even if it's a salad or a casserole then your body produces the enzymes that will break down legumes efficiently. They have a slightly different shape to carbohydrates and proteins in that they, they like a carbohydrate, but they've got their three molecule chain. It's called a trisaccharide and it's got uh, things like uh, some of those 
um, molecules are known as rachios and stephanos, and it requires a little bit of a different enzyme, which your body will make if you're eating it on a regular basis. So the first week or two that you start eating legumes, you could find you have a lot of gas and you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but it very seldom will cause reflux. I've never known it to cause reflux when it's eaten with your neutral vegetables, for example, and your rice. Or your neutral vegetables and your proteins, you can eat them together as well. But I find that most people are better with the rice and lentils or a bean, a bean and, and rice dish. Or you can just have your legumes with your neutral vegetables and it's comfortable like that too, okay? So it really, it really stands for any side. I have seen people become vegetarian and say, I can't eat the vegetables. I'm getting really bad reflux and I feel better. This is the interesting thing. My reflux goes away when I'm on a keto diet or I'm on a high-protein, high-fat, no-carbohydrate diet. Well, the very reason you're more comfortable is that you are you don't have any of this. You're not putting any of these carbohydrates in, so your stomach is just digesting here. There's no carbohydrates coming in. You're having to convert the foods that you are eating. Uh, in some of those diets, you're allowed the odd cup of berries, for example, or some of them will allow an occasional sweet potato. But you need carbohydrates, as I say, for your brain and central nervous system for every single cell. And the reason your digestive reflux problems clear up is not because carbohydrates are bad, but it's because they're no longer being digested together with protein. So there's no longer this fermentation going on with all these byproducts and you're not ending up with these the gas problems that, uh, that, um, um, that so many people end up with or with the reflux problems. So it's not... And it's an interesting thing because there was a study done. And remind me, I must tell you the story of that little boy. There was a study done many, many years ago by a man called Dr. William Beaumont, I think it was his name. He did a study on a man called Alexis St. Martin, who was a soldier from the war. It was like the 1800s in America. And he had a stomach wound. He had a stomach wound from being shot from a gunshot. And so the, what had happened is he had a hole in his stomach with a little flap of skin that you could suppress and you could look inside the stomach. You know, obviously like not straight in there, but you could see if he prodded and poked around. And so what Dr. Beaumont found is that he, he stuck a piece of uh, potato on a piece of thread and he stuck it in the stomach and he would leave it there for a period of time, like a couple of hours, and pull it out. It would be totally undigested. So he deduced from that that carbohydrates are not able to be digested by human beings at all. Completely bypassed the mouth where the process starts. He wasn't testing the duodenum, so carbohydrates are digesting in your mouth and your duodenum. Then he stuck a piece of meat into the stomach on a piece of string and it completely digested. Well, it would have because your stomach would secrete hydrochloric acid to break the protein down. So that's where the protein digestion takes place. So it's happening in these two different places, which is fascinating that the body is smart enough to do this. We're just not smart enough to realize that when we're eating carbohydrates and proteins together, most people will end up with some digestive discomfort, either feeling just bloated or full or gas, as I said, belching, farting, and some people will end up with a reflux problem. And with that comes all the things that go with irritable bowel syndrome, can go from diarrhea to constipation. There are other factors as well. So I'm going to give you some steps. This food combining aspect is really important. It's explained on the food combining chart. I can put it a lot closer over here. You can see it's really a nice chart to read. And you'll get that and print it out yourself. Uh, the little booklet that I'm going to give you will give you all the steps that I'm going to refer you to right now. And, um, and in the book Perfect, he uh, Perfect Health, there is an entire chapter, chapter four, called The Ins and Outs of Digestion. And it explains really nicely how the digestive, what I've described to you, it explains to you very clearly. There we go, the ins and outs of digestion. And I love the quote that we put here, which is, you can't ignore the important of good, importance of good digestion. The joy of life depends on a sound stump, stomach. That was Dr. Joseph Conrad. And it's pretty true. If you think of it, when your stomach's uncomfortable, you are not, there's no joy you doubled over in pain, you're uncomfortable, you sit at the dinner table, I'm not hungry, or having to get up every five minutes, it's just, or you sit, you know, you sit down after a meal, you feel like you're okay, and the next thing, the gas arrives. My mother, my whole life growing up with two parents that honestly had serious gas problems, my father would do explosive ones, but he'd, you know, play games with us and make us pull his finger, and then he'd fart, we'd think, how on earth did he do this? 
but he could control it. My mother, on the other hand, had uncontrollable gas problems and she could feel it coming and knew she'd have to leave the room. She was a bit more ladylike about it and say, I need to go for a walk. And she would literally go and walk around the garden and come back. So needless to say, with four kids, most of us ended up with the same gas problems. And I can tell you right now, they completely disappear when you don't mix proteins and starches. You never, ever feel uncomfortable in your stomach. There are some certain foods, for example, that can cause a lot of gas on their own. One is dairy products, one is gluten. And so even if they're properly combined, they could still cause gas problems. M many people today are lactose intolerant. That'll cause the gas from that side. And when it comes to gluten, it can cause inflammation in our digestive tract and contribute to things like leaky gut. And that's another complicated story. Mo most of it is because they have increased the amount of protein that's in the wheat to make it more nutritious for us. So by increasing it, we've got quite a high protein content and a high carbohydrate content, but more so also is because we consume wheat with sugar, as in cereals, bread's got sugar in it to make the yeast rise, it's in cookies, it's cakes, all of these things. And so your immune system starts to produce antibodies against the protein in the gluten, which is similar to human protein. So it can become an autoimmune condition. But when it comes to digestive issues, I would definitely get gluten out, which is the protein found in wheat. It's found in traditional oats, not guaranteed gluten-free grown oats, not telling you it's packed in a gluten-free factory. That doesn't make it gluten-free, okay? It's got to be grown like Helsinki oats that come from Finland. They're grown to have a very low protein content, so they're considered gluten-free. There's another uh, farm in the United States that grows gluten-free oats. So wheat, oats, rye, and the barley grain. If you sprout the grain and you make juice out of it, whether it's wheat grass or barley grass juice, there's no gluten in it, okay? So I want to just give you some of the steps that you can do to, so that you've got some. And while I'm going there, I want to tell you the story of, um, uh, where are we? All right. Um, the story of this mom that came to see me, a mother came to see me. There we go. Um, she came to see me uh, some years back. And she was honestly beside herself. She said, somebody had told me that maybe you can help me with my child. He's 18 months old, 18 months to two, two years old. He's had digestive problems his entire life. He's been to every pediatrician I can see, every gastrointestinal specialist. He, he's been on all kinds of things, baby and acid medication. Nobody can help him. He screams and screams and screams after every single meal. He is in pain and nobody can help him. Either they've given him painkillers, but they can't give him the very strong ones because he might not survive on them. And she said, somebody said, maybe you can help us. And I said, well, what is he eating? And she basically told me what he was eating at that point. He was eating the same diet as the parents were. They were eating meat and potatoes together. They were having rice and fish together. They were mixing their foods, and it was a very healthy diet, as in whole foods, but everything was mixed together. And previously to that, he had been on cow's milk, and cow's milk in babies, very often he could have had a lactose problem, but they put him on lactose-free milk. It still caused problems because you've got quite a high protein content and the sugar in formulation and all, and then when she was breastfeeding him, this child still had gas because he was eating from the mother and this fermentation and the uh, incorrectly or inefficiently broken down proteins and carbohydrates get into the bloodstream and they get into the breast milk so they can cause digestive discomfort in the baby. It's because those proteins and carbohydrates that aren't broken down properly get into the baby's bloodstream via or get to the baby's digestive tract via the breast milk and then that can cause cramping. So I got her to basically do exactly this. Follow the food combining chart. I said, take this home and follow it. Like letter to those two groups or those two groups. And those two groups or those two groups. Okay. And she did it. She came back two weeks late. But she came to me smiling. And she, as she opened her mouth, she started crying. She said, Marianne, I did not know that something so simple and something so sensible and she says, it makes a lot of sense when you explain it to me, could remove all this pain and suffering that my child had suffered from. She said, for nearly two years, he has been suffering and he's been in pain and he's been screaming. And my husband and I are on the verge of like falling apart. 
because the screaming just goes on all the time and we don't know what to do. We've had two very peaceful, calm. My baby is actually a wonderful, happy little boy. He's amazing. And like we're all falling in love with him and each other all over again and our lives have been a different thing. She said, who would have thought something so simple as this would just sort it out, okay? And it does. People don't like to hear this. They want to have, some people want to have the operation. They want to see every specialist. They want to go on all the drugs because it makes you feel very important. And it's actually sad to be in that place. It's really, really sad to be in a place where your disease or your condition is the most important thing in your life because it's making you feel important. What should make you feel important is the fact that you love people in your life that you have goals and a sense of purpose. And if after today you, the only goal you have is to get healthy and then help people get healthy doing the same thing you're doing, well, that's a good enough goal because you're making the world a better place. So it's really important that you actually step back and say, am I making my condition the center of my universe? Because it comes across and you'll see, you'll know you're doing it. Because you'll approach people and they'll say, how are you? Or they just stop asking how are you are because they they don't want to hear how, how you are. They don't want to hear about the doctors and the pains and the medication and the because it's actually very boring for most people to hear that stuff. Most people, they're interested, but they're more interested in their own health than your health. But if that's all you've got to talk about and everybody knows you're going to talk about it, eventually you lose all your friends. And the only ones you've got are the ones that have got equally bad conditions and you're all trying to compete with each other. And it happens. It's trying to compete with each other to see which whose specialist is the most famous, which one's the most expensive, and who's having the most procedures. Seriously, it's your decision, your health that you have today. Even if it's by default that you didn't know at all, your health that you have today is you're there because of choices you've made in your diet and decisions you've made out of possibly ignorance like most of us do. We just don't know. You know, we learn the basics of the digestive tract at school. We certainly don't go into the chemistry of it. And chemistry is not that complicated. You don't need to be a chemist to understand the basics of pH in the stomach. Okay? So don't poo-poo this and say, oh, it's not possible. I, I challenge each and every one of you. It doesn't matter what your digestive issues are. If you've even got allergies and hay fever, I'd say, I challenge you today to follow these food combining principles. Uh, the food combining chart is also um, in uh, this format that's in the book. It's in the little booklet that we can email you. It's just a PDF form book that you will get, as I said, if you send your email address. And it needs to go to Mary Ann's MP. So that's M A R Y. Deirdre, I see you there. Won't you just type it in for me, please? Mary A N N S, no E. So it's Mary Ann's with no E, no apostrophes. MP, MP stands for moving pictures, at gmail.com. So if somebody can just type that in for me, actually, I can type it in right here. Um, Let's type that in. Mary Ann's. It'll help if I put my cursor there. And mp at gmail.com. Okay. All right. It's gone. Okay. So if you email us there and give us your email address, we will email you a copy of the food combining chart, this one, in full color. It's actually the printer I did it on wasn't very colorful, but you can adjust the coloring. And then there's a little booklet on the digestive tract and all the different digestive problems in there. And you'll see these are some of the, the things that you need to be doing, okay? Some of the things that can help you. Uh, right. So there's a couple of things that you've got to you've got to change. Number one, you've got to eat slower. You have to chew your food very well. When you chew your food carefully, you secrete enough starch digesting enzyme to start the process of digesting the carbohydrates in the food that you're eating. So chew. And if you don't know what slower means, and I know that I eat too fast, and it happened once I had kids, because once your moms do this, you, you've got children and you've got them all settled down and and you sit down to eat, and the baby wakes up and wants to be fed right now. 
And then you get into, you might even get into the position where you're kind of trying to eat and feed the baby at the same time. So you eating, baby's feeding from you, and then baby needs to be winded, and you put your fork down, and you know, and you've got to get up, and you're patting the baby, and then the baby needs a nappy changed, and you were starving to start off with. So what happens as a mother very often, because you've always got, you're, you're on call as a mom when you've got children of any age and set shape and size. There's always somebody needing you. And I have adult children and grandchildren and even our first great-granddaughter. And there's always somebody who needs something. And so you tend to eat faster than you should because you've got to eat quickly so you can get up and do whatever it is you need to do. And then you get into the habit of, I've got to eat quickly just to wash the dishes. I've got to eat quickly because I've got somewhere to go. And so we get into this habit. So what helped me was learning to chew for 15 times. You can chew longer, but 15 times, 15 chews, that's mong, two. Three, four, five, six, chew, chew, chew. Fifteen counts, and then you swallow. Now, when that happens, it enzymes mixed in there thoroughly and can carry on digesting in the in the duodenum and in the stomach until it gets the duodenum. Because even you've got a lot of tile and that enzyme in there, it carries on breaking down in the stomach as long as the pH stays at four and above. As long as you don't have concentrated proteins with it, It'll keep digesting in the stomach. And you'll never get bloated. You won't have the flatulence, okay? So that's the one, okay? Uh, let's see. Make this bigger. All right. Eating too much. Eating too much. If you hold your fist up like this, look at it and say, that's how big my stomach is. If that's how big your stomach is, you really should never eat more than one moderate plate of food. What is a moderate plate? Plate. This is a side plate or a bread plate. And I would say this is pretty much a moderate plate. It looks huge, but if you look at it, the side plate kind of fits on it. It's a curved plate. So it's just a little bit bigger than your bread plate. It's not about starving yourself at all. It's about eating in moderation. Don't try and take the stomach. It's going to stretch like that. Do you want to stretch it there or stretch it there? You'll know you've eaten too much food. If you get up from the table and you have to undo your button or go and change your clothing because it's too tight. And ladies, I know this. When you've eaten too much, sometimes you need to remove your bra as well because it just feels like it's pushing in your lungs. Your stomach is full. So if you go to bed at night and your stomach is, you're having to adjust your clothing, you've eaten too much. That's how you know it. You've eaten enough when you sigh, listen for the sigh, okay? When your body's had enough food, you will sigh. And a sigh is just a, that's what it is, just sigh. That means stop the food. Now, for most people, that may be when you're only halfway through your plate of food. There's nothing wrong with taking that food, putting it in a cover over it in the refrigerator or in the kitchen in a cool spot and saying, I will eat this at my next meal. But we've almost got this starvation mentality. If I don't eat it now, I'm going to be hungry later on. Fasting on a regular basis, doing a digestive rest once a week for one day, 24 hours, is a very good thing to do because it gets you into the habit of realizing you won't die if you don't eat. And so you don't feel so frenetic and, and desperate to eat that plate of food. Sometimes it is very delicious. And I know the food that we make, Mark tells me that our food is too delicious we often get them any food that's left over from the restaurant just comes home to the property and whoever needs something, you know, will have, have some if there's enough. Very often there isn't anything left. But he said to me, I don't want any food coming from the restaurant. It's too delicious. And I'm eating too much. So let's just keep it simple. But, you know, even with us, as we just have our baked potato with our herb salt and a bit of olive oil, and they straight out of the ground, the potatoes, man, you want to eat three, four of them. And I'm talking about big ones. So it's... It involves discipline, and the way to help you is to hear, listen for that sigh. If you hear it, stop, push the plate away. What happens is if we sigh again the second time, the third time, the fourth time, usually your body gives up somewhere around there. Fourth, fifth, sixth time, it just stops sighing. It says, I'm giving up. You want to kill yourself at an early date? Well, you go ahead and do it. Okay, so that sigh is the body's way of saying you've had enough. Now, when you chew slowly, it gives you time to listen to that sigh. When you're gobbling your food, you're eating it so fast, it's not broken down enough, it takes a lot longer for the body to hear the sigh. And by then you're just uncomfortable, okay? So very important that we eat less. 
Okay, so lactose intolerance can cause a lot of gas, and the gas in the stomach can push up and push that food up into the esophagus as well. So just making gas in the stomach. You may not have eaten a lot. You're just eating the wrong food, like lactose from yogurt, milk, and cheese can cause gas. And if it does, just take it out. Not everybody's lactose intolerant. You, the darker your skin is, the more likely you are to be lactose intolerant. But people of light skin can also be lactose intolerant. It's becoming more and more common. Milk is not what it used to be. It used to be raw, straight from the cow, fermented naturally. Now it's homogenized, pasteurized, stabilized, put in tetra packs, kept on the shelf. It's just... Uh, we don't need cow's milk. There's no need for it. There's nothing in it that we need. The, cal the calcium in it is way too difficult for us to use because there's too much phosphorus in there. So it binds it. So you really, we know that the countries that consume the most cow's milk products are the ones with the most brittle bone disease and the ones with the most dental decay. Look at the statistics. If in doubt, look at the independent statistics, not the ones funded by the food companies, okay? All right, consumption of legumes. Consumption of legumes can sometimes cause... Gas problems, as I explained earlier on, if you're not used to eating them, you're not used to secreting that digestive enzyme. And so until your body secretes the digestive enzyme, you'll have a bit of gas initially. So you're not likely, I haven't really seen much, unless you've eaten too much, but if you're having a salad with some beans in it or some chickpeas in it, it shouldn't cause gas if you're eating it on a regular basis. You may need to take intestinal flora. And I've got some, where have I got mine here? Intestinal, uh, this is the one I use from AIM. The Flora Food, I'll put that over there. It's Flora Food from the AIM company. It's the best intestinal flora I've seen. We've seen such changes in people with digestive problems, autism, uh, anybody with a gut biome that's out of balance, allergies, you get them onto this. Elderly people, people with B12 deficiencies, get them onto the Flora Food. Put your friendly bacteria back into the gut, okay? So if you've got continual gas problems and you're combining properly, it could show a gut insufficiency. And you just take one or two a day until you finish the bottle, and then you don't need it again unless it starts happening again. Antibiotics, eating lots of raw onion and garlic, drinking tap water because it's got chlorine in it, which is a sterilizing agent. Drinking any con alcohol anytime. Alcohol is a sterilizing agent, as is vinegar. That will sterilize your digestive tract. So make sure that you take a flora food a day. You'll have to live on it. It's not harmful. It's just you don't need it if you're not having alcohol or anything like that in it, okay? All right, so changing your diet to one that contains more fresh fruits and vegetables can initially cause bloating for some people, and that's very often because there's a lot of old fecal matter in the digestive tract. Now, we've got these little um, – I'm looking for my dishcloth. I normally keep it here. Uh, we've got these little uh, villi. They're finger-like protrusions. They're not the size of your finger. They're tiny. They're more like a towel. If you took a fluffy towel and you rolled it up, not that size, okay? Your intestines are small like this. You've got these tiny little villi. They're like little things that wave around like this to increase the surface area so you can absorb more nutrients more efficiently. But over the years of eating a processed diet, a refined diet, eating too much, eating animal products, on a regular basis, you get this old fecal matter. It's like a sludge of old fecal matter. It gets stuck in these little finger-like protrusions. And so what I recommend is that you take something like herbal fiber blend. I didn't bring my bottle up here, or did I? No, I forgot. Actually, it's down there. I'll grab it quickly. Ah, here we go. Herbal fiber blend. It comes in a powder or in these capsules as well. Herbal fiber blend. What it forms is amazing gel. You can take it in water and drink it, or you can take the capsules. But what it does is when the water, you need to drink a whole full glass, a big glass like this. Two of those or one of these when you've had it. it what it does is it forms this gel, and as, you, as, the, as it sort of swells up the gel, it pulls. It's amazing. When you actually mix it up, I should have had some here. I'll try and get some for tonight and do it in the next session. You mix up the herbal fiber blend in water and let it stand just to see what it does. It forms almost like Play-Doh with, with a little bit of water. With more water, the, the gel is more easier to move along. So it's like it like pulls this muck out of here. So when you take it, the average person can lose between 1 and 10 kilograms of old fecal matter which does mean you could have quite a lot of bowel movements. It's not diarrhea. It's just like four, five, six bowel movements a day with the sludge coming out. Okay, That improves your rate of absorption. 
it improves the condition in the stomach so that you find that your friendly bacteria can live there more friendly. So it's important to give it a good clean. I tell people, I recommend you just do this maybe once a year. If you are eating animal products every day, I'd recommend at least. Well, you've got to make sure you know that your gut's working efficiently. If your bowel movements are as thick as your forefinger, thicker than that, you're actually constipated. You may go to the bathroom every day, but if it's thicker than that, it's constipation is lying there for too long and it's getting thicker and thicker and thicker. If it's going out within 12 to 24 hours, it's as thick as your forefinger. So you can have a look and measure it and see. And uh, once you've taken this, you'll find that it'll be that thick. And if it's getting thicker than that, you know you need herbal fiber blend. So you just need to keep an eye on it. And if you're straining, you shouldn't have to strain. You can just go to the bathroom and it comes out. You don't need to be pushing and going red in the face. That's an indication of constipation. All right. So where are we? Change. We don't need this. Okay. Any substances in themselves that are fermented. Some people consume and make their own fermented foods. But with some people, and not everybody, some people, and I'm one of them, my digestive tract doesn't like anything fermented in it. It just doesn't help me at all. I find that I get gas and I get reflux. It's uncomfortable. My stomach's not comfortable with fermented foods. The, remember, the acetic acid is a sterilizing agent. So if you're going to have vinegar in your diet or eat fermented foods, I know they're telling you there's all this bacteria in it, but you've also got to see as how it's fermented. If there's not, there's too much acetic acid in it, and it's like just, really like drinking vinegar, then you better take some flora food with that. Okay? All right. And that's an international company. You can get those in the United States. Um, if you need to know where to get it, just email us as well, and we will give you that information. All right. Um, carbonated drinks contribute to gas problems as well. So, for example, you have a meal, and you're drinking something with bubbles in it, gas in it, in fact, drinking any liquid with a meal can result in your digestive tract just coming to a, a grinding halt. Because you go and eat the, eat, you're eating this food, pH is four and above as alkaline, proteins is two to three. Now you go and pour a whole lot of water into the stomach, it's pH of seven, it's going to bring it all the way up here. So your proteins are definitely going to stop digesting. Well, carbohydrates are going to take longer, and that's why it's not a good idea to drink while you eat. It slows down the process because now the body's got to try and fix this mess up and can just start secreting more hydrochloric acid because that's the only thing that it actually has in the digestive tract that can try and help. And that's just going to make the stomach contents more and more and more acidic. That's why you get this terrible acid in some people. If it's really got a mess in the stomach and your stomach's not working properly, you over secreting hydrochloric acid and doctors will very often give you medication to make your stomach to stop doing that that means you can't digest stop proteins anymore so now you can't break down proteins and you may end up deficient in a whole lot of nutrients because hydrochloric acid doesn't only activate pepsinogen for your your proteins to digest efficiently it also helps the body to produce vitamin b12 so when you start taking something to suppress your body's ability to make hydrochloric acid you may end up with a vitamin b12 deficiency that'll affect your central nervous system and the brain you may not get enough protein because you can't break it down efficiently so it's very important that we um are kind to our stomach Putting those carbonated drinks into it, I would say if you're going to have carbonated drink, have it on an empty stomach, not with a meal and not straight afterwards. Have it in between and always before a meal what you can do is just drink some water. Drink the water in between. Wait for at least two hours after a meal before you start consuming. If you're dying of thirst because there was a lot of salt in it, a little sip, little sips or suck on an ice cube will be a lot just little amounts of water, not a whole glass. Don't glug it down. It's, drink, sip it slowly. All right. Now, if you eat anything that's high in mustard oil, like foods from the um, garlic and onion family, they're very high in something called mustard oil. And mustard oil can contribute to um, digestive problems. And um, and mu mustard oil is is like a, almost like a sterilizing agent as well mustard oil is usually anything as i say that that and that's probably one of the reasons why some people can get uh, gas from cabbage 
So some people get gas from it, some don't get any gas from it. I don't get gas from cabbage. I'll get it from garlic and onion, for example. So you've got to see, like, there's too much mustard oil and garlic and onion, and there's too much of something called allicin, which is a natural antibiotic, which is found in garlic and onion. It's a much smaller amount in other foods, not to that extent that it'll upset your bacteria. But what I do is if I do go out and I eat a meal that's got garlic and onion in it and it was cabbage and there was everything else, cabbage I don't have a problem with unless there's a whole lot of garlic and onion. I get home and I take this uh, flora food. That's what I take there. Oh, there's another thing that I wanted to get out of my box. Anyway, I'll get that later. Um, where are we? The next one. And incorrect food combining, as I spoke already, and then uh, insufficient digestive enzyme production. Now, some people don't secrete enough digestive enzymes. Most of our digestive enzymes are made in the pancreas. So if you've got a pancreatic problem, for example, you're diabetic, it could mean that your digestive process is not as efficient as it should be. And so I would recommend that what you do is you um, you could take digestive enzymes. And you get various ones. The ones that I find are the best are called prepzymes. They're from the same company as your flora food and your herbal fiber blend. Prepzymes, it's a company called AIM, and if you don't know how to get it, if you're on the program, somebody's invited you, and it should be a game changer. A game changer is somebody who helps you in the Zoom sessions on any of our programs. All of our programs are 30-day 30 30 detox, 100 days to health, 365. They are all designed to help you get your body to a place where it can repair itself very efficiently. I recommend that if you've got something really drastically wrong and you want to see dramatic results and you're just tired of playing games, 30-day detox will give you a kickstart. But it is very powerful, and the symptoms of detox can be quite strong. The one that's great for families is the 100 Days to Health. That's an amazing program. It's gentle, takes its time, and it teaches you to eat. You learn a lot more about your body on the 100 Days to Health. But if you want to learn as much as I know about the human body, you can do the 365, maybe not as much, but you learn about 12 body systems, 12 pillars of health. You really learn about your body. And it's like, as I was saying, you're not engaged to health anymore. 100 days is being engaged. 30 days is like when you meet them and there's all this emotions and passion and it's intense. 100 days is like being engaged, preparing for marriage. 365 is you married to health. You don't want to play games anymore. You don't want to dabble in health. You just want to be healthy and not think about it anymore. And that's what what happens. You live in the sweet spot where you don't think about this stuff anymore. It just comes naturally to you. It takes time, but it's worth it. You save an enormous amount of money. Think of all these pills, powders, and potions we take to like stop to ease us up and we're going to bed with antacids and we're taking, I used to take bicarb sometime on top of all of that stuff because it wasn't working. We walk around uncomfortable, we walk around being embarrassed because we bloated or we're getting rid of gas. And at the end of the day, if you want your digestive tract to work efficiently, you need to treat this with the respect and kindness it deserves. But to, to know that, you to know how to do that, you need to understand your body. And hopefully from today, I've taught you enough. You don't have to go on our programs. You can just read the food combining chart and you can follow it and you must probably have an amazing results. But if you want to stay on track and stay in a community and learn more and not just know a little bit that's sticking out from the iceberg, you know, a little tip, you want to know more so that you can actually manage your health yourself and not be dependent on having to go on webinars all the time because you can manage your body, then you can get onto our Zoom supported programs. They are on a weekly Zoom. We have Zoom sessions once a week to support them, okay? So then uh, gluten intolerance, I did mention, and then vitamin and mineral supplements. Vitamin and mineral supplements can cause tremendous strain on the digestive tract because of the concentration. Now, vitamin C in supplement form is the safest of all to take, but don't stop there. Listen to what I'm going to say. It can cause gout, arthritis, kidney stones, osteoporosis, and stomach ulcers. It can cause a lot of inflammation in the digestive tract, and that's not going to help you with your reflux problem at all. Vitamins are highly concentrated. They're not meant to be taken in such concentrated forms. If they did, they'd grow on trees. You get all the vitamin C you need in a tomato or in an orange or a peach or you're getting your beta carotene in your butternut, anything that's yellow and red, you're getting like lutein, uh, lycopene in a tomato. But if you put the green things into your body, like your barley grass juice, you're getting lutein 
and ZX xanthine, which are carotenoids that help your eyes function efficiently. Now you can go to the local optometrist and they'll sell that to you in a bottle, but it's not in a form that's designed to go into the body. It's just a molecule like this. Whereas when it's an actual food extract, if it's actually juiced out of it or you ate it, you can dry the juice and take it in a dried juice, then you're getting an organic structure. You're getting the vitamin C attached to a carbon molecule. You can use it fully. It's not going to cause inflammation. And your body will stop you because if you're eating foods that are too high in vitamin C, your tongue starts to get sensitive and your body says, don't eat this anymore. Don't have another tomato. My tongue's so sore. If it ever happened to you, have eaten a tomato and you think, oh, nice tomato, but my tongue's getting sore from it. That's your body's way of saying you're having enough vitamin C. The other things as well, you'll eat so many bananas and then you're like, I can't handle anymore. Your body's telling you you have enough. There's no way of knowing if you had enough when you are taking vitamin supplements. They're very expensive and 90 to 96% of them get flushed out via the kidneys, causing kidney stones and can cause problems with the, ki with the kidneys, uh, the, the actual uh, processing of materials out of the body. So your kidneys become less efficient the more supplements you take. So you're better off eating a lot of whole food, plant-based foods. In our book, Perfect Weight and Perfect Health, we explain clearly how to do that. Uh, if you get the food combining chart, you can follow the, these steps in the middle over here. I'm going to have to read this a bit small. There's some nice guidelines over here that you can follow in the interim. Uh, and it tells you about eating fruit on an empty stomach. Don't mix fruit. Fruit doesn't like to be digested with cooked food much. Really doesn't. But if you were going to eat a fruit, for example, with a carbohydrate, you'd find bananas would digest more comfortably. So you could make a banana pie. And if you wanted to eat a nut, and you'll learn this stuff in the book and on the programs, uh, if you want to eat a pecan nut pie, well, we make the crust with muesli or oats. And then the filling is made with either cashew nuts, which are very low in protein, or you can use tofu. And you put the pecan nuts in, and then you sweeten it naturally with either apple juice or date syrup or honey or fructose um, but you can make a pecan nut pie and pecan nuts are very low in protein they're high in fat so they're okay eaten with a carbohydrate macadamia nuts are also low in protein high in fat they're actually comfortable with a carbohydrate but still concentrated foods like nuts and seeds even if they low in protein are very high in fats usually and you need to be careful with the amount of concentrated food. So if you eat a lot of fat with carbohydrates, you could find your food repeats on you, particularly if it's fats that have been heated and fried. You know you can eat a baked potato with olive oil on it. It doesn't repeat on you. You go and buy some potato chips from the local store. It's heated and fried at a temperature. It shouldn't be heated and fried at. Very difficult for us to digest when it's in that form. And then you can find you can get reflux just from eating potato chips, but they've been deep fried in oil. The temperature, you can't digest a fats that have been heated over uh, between 40 and maybe 80 degrees centigrade. So we can find that we end up having problems digesting foods that have been fried, even though there's no protein with them. So that's another one of the things that you may find. All right, I'm open for questions. If I've left anything else, I'm going to start answering your questions and I will answer them verbally. Um, right. Thank you, Deirdre, for your kind words. All uh, right, saying thank you. This is very important live chat. Thank you so much. Wonderful, informative, Mary, and, and so well presented. Thank you very much. Sometimes I fumble and stumble and think, thank you, watching from Australia. All right, well, it sounds like there's not any questions. You're all just being very flattering to me today. So I'm going to thank you for your time and tell you that if you're looking for the chart and you're wanting the digestive booklet, which is how many pages long, I'll tell you that. Right now, it's 30 pages long. It's a little booklet, all on digestive problems and the food combining chart. Then I would recommend that you email us at the address I put up there, which is Marianne's MP, M for movie, P for um, play, and uh, or pictures, whichever one you want to use. Movie, moving pictures or moving movie plays. Uh, so it's Marianne's MP at gmail.com. Please send us your email address. And if you're watching this and you're not on live, you can do the same. You can email us. Um, and if you need to know more about our natural, our 30-day detox, 100 days to health, or our 365, or our natural health and nutrition courses, if you want to take this further 
as your full-time practice or something to add to your existing practice. Like we have iridologists, we've got doctors, we've got dietitians, we've got nurses that are doing the natural health and nutrition. We've got moms, we've got students who are wanting to do it. They're homeschoolers and they're wanting to study nutritious, nutrition. They're doing it to actually be prepared for life. So we have a natural health and nutrition program and a business program. You can go on to wholeworldwell.com and you can go on there and see if there's anything that you'd like to do and see how we can help you further. But more than that, I'm going to say is God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Always a privilege to meet with people and help them. And I pray that you go on to have exceptional health like Mark and I have had. Haven't had a doctor's bill due to ill health for over 30 odd years now, probably 35 years. And we are well into our 60s. Mark will be turning 70 next year. And I'm midway through and on the way over the other side of 60. So we are doing incredibly well. Yesterday we had three hour hike up the mountain and another hour's walk on the beach. We live between the mountains and the beach, so it's a great place to live. And wherever you're living, anybody can walk. And the best thing about it is you never have any aches and pains. You always feel amazing. And as I keep telling everybody, I have a personal goal to live 120 as long as my digestive tract and my bladder and my brain are all working efficiently to that age. God bless you and hope to see you on the journey. I see there are a couple of things coming in. Uh, morning, does a hernia ever heal using your food combining chart? Yes, it does, Isabel. Uh, it really does work. Your hiatus hernia we're talking about, okay, which is that little flap that's having a little hiatus. It, it sp spills up and through there, okay. So, it's herniation. It's like um, sometimes it's just like also sometimes in some people it could be a bit of muscle pushing through there. The fasting of the water helps as well. But just combining your food properly stops that incredible fermentation. You don't have all that gas building up. And the gas building up will push, push the flap through backwards if it needs to do it or push some tissue or muscle creating that herniation, which is, I don't know whether it's true herniation or if it's just the fact that that, valve is not working properly but either way what happens is because there isn't this fermentation with all this gas your body can heal with that you don't have to fast but fasting speeds up the healing that's what it does so if you're ready to fast with other hernias so say for example you've got a um, you know herniation of the intestine through a muscle for example fasting helps with those because what happens is the intestines empty out and just collapse through the muscle while you're on a fast it repairs so other kinds of herniation are, are healed through fasting. But you can it can heal just by food combining. It just takes a lot longer because you're not emptying the stomach completely. But if you're going to fast, make sure you understand it. In my book, Perfect Health, there's an entire chapter on fasting and help you to fast on your own and not be scared of it. I think the best thing about living this way for me, besides the fact that there's no doctor's bills, is that there's no fear. I don't fear getting cancer. I don't fear having heart disease. I don't fear having getting the latest virus or bacteria or fungus because I know how my immune system works. I know how my body works. I know what I need to do. And if I sometimes go off the rails, which I don't do anymore because it's just not worth it in the beginning, the first 10, 15 years, well, you'd have a cheat here and a cheat there and a little cheat there. But Honestly, the taste in my mouth is not worth the way I feel the next day. So I want to feel good, especially once you get over 50. I think that's when Mark and I really sort of was like, once you're over 50, you don't want to play this game anymore. <laughs> you just like feeling amazing. You like your brain to feel like in control, like that it can just work like this. You can understand anything you read, anything you do. You're understanding it. You can grasp concepts really quickly. And for most people getting older, that's not the case, sadly. I have seen any condition heal. I can't tell you a condition that doesn't heal, even when it's genetic. But I will tell you, if you lost your finger in an accident, it's not likely to grow back. I do know of people whose tonsils have grown back because there was a little bit of tissue there and they grew back, but that's pretty rare. I had mine taken out at four years old because nobody knew it, dairy intolerant, and then you just get go from having tonsillitis to having sinusitis and inflammation in other parts. I took the dairy out, all of that stopped. So did all the mucus and the spluttering and coughing and everything else that went with it and the inflammation in the stomach. So 
I see any other questions here. I'm unable to get herbal fiber blend in the UK. Is there an alternative? Ebony, you can get something called Fit and Fiber from the same company. They don't do the herbal fiber there because there's one of the herbs, I think it's Cascara Sagrada, that in the UK, I'm in quite uh, amazed that they won't allow something with a particular herb to come into the UK. The product's made in the United States. It's developed by herb herbalists. In the UK, there are herbalists and people that practice all kinds of herbal things. Do you use herbs for all kinds of things. And if you look at the culture in the UK, it was very much the sort of druids and the herbalists, and the and there was this quite a you know influence of those pagan practices of working with herbs. And now they won't let you have herbal fiber blend, but they do make another product called Fit and Fiber, which has water soluble fiber in it that actually helps does help to clean out a certain amount of the digestive tract. It just doesn't kill parasites, which is also a problem with regurgitation, is make sure you're getting rid of the parasites. Para 90 is a product that apparently also not available in the UK. You can, if you know somebody in South Africa, for example, or in the United States, you can get them to post it to you directly as a gift, and they seem to let it in, but they don't want you to sell it there. And I think it's what's got to happen is the company that manufactures it aim really just needs to approach the organizations in the UK and get it through. But it's such a very expensive program and there are not enough customers. But my thinking is spend the money and the customers will come because it's, it's an amazing product. But Fit and Fiber will help you as well. All right. Um, and then um, also eating a lot of fresh fruit in the diet. It's really gentle, water-soluble fiber. Really helps. But the food combining, if I had to say what's the most important thing, it's the food combining. So you make sure that you get this chart and you print it out and you stick it on your refrigerator. You can laminate it and you just follow it. Maybe not all the foods you know are on there, but you'll get the gist of it um, and you'll be able to follow it. All right. Um, can I get these products in Australia? Karen, yes, you can. And you can contact, um, contact us at info at wholeworldwell.com. And we will sell you, send you the details. There are a lot of um, people that use it in Australia, and I'll put you in touch with whoever's closest to you, and you can find out the details from them. But there is an office there, and they do provide the products in Australia, Herbal Fiber Blend, uh, the Flora Food, all of it's available there. And we're seeing amazing results. We've actually got a nurse, Rachel O'Connor, who has helped a lot of people. She says the best thing about using these products and being on these programs is that for once in her life, 27 years, she was in emergency nursing, really just helping alleviate people's suffering and discomfort. And she says now she's helping people get well and stay well, which is what she never saw in nursing. She was just managing their disease and helping them, as I say, feel comfortable. And now she's helping them to manage their bodies and then they're watching their bodies repair themselves. And that's so exciting to watch. All right. Um, Edward says, follow the program. It really works. Edward, yes, I'm sure you know it like all of us do. Um, right. I love fruit. I've tried one fruit meal a day, but I get terrible gas and diarrhea when I eat fruit. So now I stay away from fruit mostly. What causes this and how can I safely enjoy the fruits? Celeste, the main reason this will happen is because your digestive tract is probably not in a healthy condition. So what I would recommend you first do is that fruit has a very cleansing effect because of the water-soluble fiber. And when you eat the skins, it's the insoluble fiber. So you're getting the insoluble fiber and the water-soluble fiber inside. And what that does is it actually, put, as I say, it tends to actually clean the digestive tract. So if you've got old fecal matter, it's just getting it out in a hurry. I would make sure that you wash your fruit carefully. I'd use a nice natural organic um, or um, what's the word, uh, biodegradable and safe cleaning. You just put a little drop. We've got one that's made from orange peel here um, that, that we have made for us. And we put a drop of that into warm water and we wash all our fruit and vegetables in there. There are some times where I literally just take this and kind of rub it on my, my jeans, usually not on my arm, and then I'll eat it. Um, but you will find that if you're eating fruit and you've got this problem, I would stick to things like apples first. Stick to the simple fruit. Try eating only an apple at a time, an apple a day. We do need to increase it because your apples provide most of your vitamins, whereas your vegetables 
provide most of your minerals. We need the combination. We get high levels of vitamin C in our fruit and lots of water-soluble fiber. So it's just usually that the digestive tract is not used to it. When you change your diet, very often can be very gassy as the body adjusts to it and cleans up. So I'd start with one apple a day. And I'd have that on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. Very often fruit can upset our digestive tract because we've got this mess in our stomach like this. And four hours after eating a meal, you can still have this mess in your stomach. And now you go and put some fruit on top of that. Fruit digests really quickly. So now you've got a fermented mess in there. You've put fruit on there and fruit is pre-digested. It wants to get out of the stomach within an hour. Now it can't because it's trapped because of this mess. The residue of this mess is still in your stomach. And now you put the fruit on top and your stomach just explodes. It's like, I can't handle this. Get all of this stuff out. It's just too much, okay? So the best thing to do, I would recommend, is try doing a 24-hour fast. Like maybe don't have supper one night and then don't have breakfast and lunch. And then that next meal for supper the following day, just eat some apples. Just one or two apples and see how your digestive tract handles it. So very, very common is either you're not used to eating any fruit, you've got to get used, or you've got this residue of this fermented mess in your stomach, and the body just says, get it all out, and you can get diarrhea from it, and you get a big fat cleanse. When you push past that, usually, you'll find that your digestive tract copes a lot better. But you know, it's also, I know I can eat these particular nectarines, they're very pale, but they are the most delicious nectarines, these ones. They've got more flavor than the ones that are bright orange. And they're so nice. This one's not quite ripe. They are so delicious that I can end up eating six, seven, eight, and I'm like, oh, so delicious. My stomach can work a lot more efficiently after that. It does have. It's a lot of fiber that you're putting in there, and it'll clean out. Things like the peach family, for example, we tend to eat them too fast and too much. So I'd try one or two to start off with, and don't, um, don't put it on top of – make sure your stomach's completely empty. Uh, it's difficult to know until you felt what it feels like. Most people's stomachs are not completely empty. They've still got a residue of a meal beforehand. Um, if you've still got that feeling like there's something in your stomach and it's still making noises and there's still gas, wait until it's completely quiet and rested before you eat. And if you're unsure, then stick to your neutral vegetables, which is this one here in the middle. Stick just to neutral foods. So say, for example, you had a oh, – upside down. Say, for example, you had a, a protein meal. Let's say you had carbohydrates for breakfast. Let's say you had something like carbohydrates for breakfast, and you now want to have lunch, and you're thinking of maybe having some nuts or seeds or some chicken or fish, and then what you'll do is you'll just stick to the neutral vegetables. So have a big salad. Put some avocados in it. Fats are, are avocados here. These ones are off my tree. I'm so proud of them. Um – We've got this food forest we've been planting. And this year, this tree's got the most avocados. It looks like it's over 300. And these are some of the early ones. They're still small. And uh, they're fats. And so they're neutral. You can eat them with proteins and starches, but you can have a big salad with avocados in them, for example. All righty, let's go. Um, all right. I have some para 90 South Africa that I can post to the UK. Unfortunately, no herbal fiber blend. All right. So Belinda has para 90, which can help to clean the digestive tract as well. Um, if it's your first time taking para 90, I normally say take herbal fiber blend first to give it a, a sort of gentler curl, click clean. Um, and if you've, but if all you've got is para 90, normally you would take one para 90 three times a day. I would start off taking just one para 90 a day initially. Very powerful herbs. It cleans the digestive tract. You don't, it's not that it all explodes and comes from all over there, but do take the flora food with it because as parasites, there's quite a lot of garlic in there that kills parasites. You need the flora food to keep your intestinal bacteria in balance. So when you do use flora, flora uh, para 90. Belinda is in Holland and you can contact her. Belinda, you can just pop your address in there for somebody to contact you. All right. Basically, that looks like it. You got any more questions that you'd like to ask? Um, any more questions you'd like to ask? Don't be shy. I'm happy to answer a couple more questions while Belinda puts her email address up there. Um, if for any, if you want to contact anybody who's offered some help here and you've missed the address, don't panic. Just put info at wholeworldwell.com. And Claudia, my very trusted assistant and right-hand woman, and my husband, Mark, they also help tremendously. Uh, they will 
put you in touch with people that have offered things. We know all the people that are uh, game changers. Game changers are people who've done the 365 or are on it, and they help people to get onto the programs. They've got WhatsApp or social media groups. They support you in a group. They help you with what do you cook, how do you make, how do you do. Everybody shares recipes. It's a great social community. It's like finding your tribe when you get into a game changers group. You really, and what's happened is so many of the people have become good friends. They're actually going to each other's countries and meeting each other because they they want to know where are you, what are you doing. You're such a nice person online. I want to meet you personally. Who knows? Maybe we'll have some weddings happening. But we do know there's long-term friendships that have been formed. All right. Um, so I'm going to say God bless you again. Stay well. And as I say, if you have any further questions and you'd like the chart and the little booklet, email us at generalquestionsinfo at wholeworldwell.com. And for the special offer, it's Mary Ann's, no E with an S, Mary A-N-N-S, M-P, at gmail.com god bless you stay well get healthy and let's get the whole world well i am on a mission we've got to try and reach a million people to have completed our programs by the end of 2025 because i have seen it myself and so many other people that when we are well when our bowels are comfortable when we're sleeping well at night when we've got the energy when all these things are gone and the body's working well there's nothing like the mental clarity you get it's like all mental issues just go away anxiety because when you're sleeping properly at night, they will go. When you're eating properly, they do go. Anxiety goes, stress goes. And even if you have stress, you manage it. Um, indigestion, all these things that cause these discomfort and stress, when that's all gone, your brain is so crystal clear and we're mentally well. And we need more people. We need millions. In fact, we need billions of sane people in the world that we're living in. We really, really do. And this is one of the ways, is helping people get well. So I will continue. Next month, we'll be doing something on autism with Jane Casey from Chicago in the United States. She raised twin boys who were very autistic, and she's going to be telling her story. I'll be asking her questions. So watch out for the email for that. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get the notifications of the upcoming talks as well, and you'll be able to make sure that you hear so not only subscribe, click that notification bell so you can be notified. And by more people subscribing, it helps us to help you. And we can do more of this and help to make the whole world well. Get on board, get well, stay well, and I'll see you anon. Bye. Where is my mouse?